make sure I start recording. <laughs> um, so welcome everybody. My name is Katie Marshall. I'm the director at McCrosty Art Center and we are very fortunate to be hosting uh, Candace Creel Falcone's exhibit, Interior Intimacies, this month. And we're very excited to welcome them to our artist talk series and our first talk of 2021. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to check out the exhibit on our website, it is at macrostyartcenter.org. Um, there's a kind of a little gallery walkthrough and a slideshow of the images, which we'll get to see tonight as well. And you are also welcome to come see them in person at Macrosty Art Center in downtown Grand Rapids. The exhibit will be up through January 30th. Um, and right now we're open slightly limited hours, Wednesday through Saturday, um, 10 to 4. But you can also make an appointment if those times don't work. And I'm happy to run over and meet people anytime. So, um, yeah, I think that's about all I need to say. Um, for those that are just joining us, um, just letting you know the session is going to be recorded. Um, you're welcome to keep your cameras on um, during the first part of this and certainly during the Q&A later on. Um, I will keep other folks muted um, at the beginning here, but then if you have a question or need to say anything, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and um, yeah, and there should be plenty of time for, for conversation and discussion um, afterwards. So um, yes, I hope that we will, uh, that you'll stick around and uh, um, yeah. <laughs> so I think um, without further ado, I will just hand it over to Candice and uh, yes, thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much for that introduction, Katie. And thank you all for joining me today. Um, it's really an honor to be able to speak about the work with you all. And um, I appreciate everybody taking a little bit of time out of their day, maybe thinking about uh, shifting out of thinking about the big P politics that have been definitely dominating our discourse and reality lately um, and thinking more about like the little p politics of our domestic spaces in which we live and interact with. Um, I also want to thank the McCrosty staff and board for their support for hosting the show and specifically give a shout out to my friend Kayla, who I think I saw pop on, who really encouraged me to apply to put my work out there and um, really help inspire the creation of, you know, five more paintings that I worked on through the year of 2020. And then I also wanted to just acknowledge that I'm calling in from the ancestral lands of the Dakota people, specifically the Middle Wakatan, and I honor their past, present, and future stewardship of these lands, also known as Erhard here in Ottertail County. So I wanted to just orient us with a shot from the gallery for those who haven't been able to see the paintings um, and talk a little bit about um, you know, the work in terms of its scale and how I hope that you see some conversations both within each individual piece and the ways they're working with each other. Um, each of the paintings are 48 by 48 inches or four by four feet squares, and they are mixed media, primarily acrylic paint um, with some good old uh, household latex paint and also uh, mixed media uh, cross stitch that is sewed into the canvas. So I wanted to give a little bit of context if any of you tuned into my KXE interview that I had earlier this uh, week, you might have heard me talking with Katie over there about how I'm kind of new to visual art. Um, so I just wanted to give a little context about my artistic journey and then I'll talk about some of the broad themes in the work and then I'll be happy to stand for questions at the end of like, you know, my 15 to 20 minute talk. Uh, if you have things as they come up, feel free to use the chat and I'm looking forward to the conversation afterwards. So my entire life, I've been fascinated by the power of storytelling and the ways that um, images in particular can help tell stories. And um, even though it wasn't until pretty recently that I started making my own visual imagery as a really important part of my own narrative storytelling, I have long been um, interested in better understanding how images particularly make meaning related to gender, sexuality, and femininity. Um, so going back through my educational experiences as an undergraduate uh, student 
in the early 2000s. I went to the University of Kansas and I majored in women's and gender studies psychology and minored in leadership. So I had a very full full plate and I finished in four years with two majors and a minor. And I really wanted to hang out with all the cool artists, but I had no way of like formally integrating that academic training into my, my schedule. Um, I ended up writing an honors thesis about what was then at the time kind of this emerging genre of reality pornography. Some of you might recall Girls Gone Wild at the beginning of the 2000s. And so I was really fascinated with like, how do visual images construct ideas related to, again, these themes of gender, sexuality, and femininity. And then I was so interested in some of those ideas that I went on to pursue a PhD at the University of Minnesota um, in feminist studies. And there I really began exploring digital storytelling and thinking about how do you add writing to images um, in, in ways to elevate the storytelling beyond just words or beyond just image. And then I also really reconnected to my identity as a creative maker um, with my wonderful Prima, who's on the, on the Zoom here today. Um, she and I would gather weekly to do Chicana Craft Day, where we would like make things and like kind of heal from the traumas of like our dissertation work and the difficulties of doing this like really heady academic work. And so after that, I went to the university, or sorry, I, um, after I graduated, I taught at a regional Northwestern University for almost 10 years in the Women's and Gender Studies program. I taught digital storytelling. I incorporated all these different kinds of media into my work and my pedagogy. And it wasn't until 2017 when I went on sabbatical that I decided like I was kind of tired of thinking in words. And on a whim, I, uh, signed up for a class at the community college in the spring of 2018 in um, the visual arts program. And I quickly fell in love with thinking about how can you make your mind um, grapple with representational work of taking something in your mind and putting it into a 2D form. And so um, I successfully completed that degree in 2020, this last spring, and have since been making work and trying to get it out there. So um, this work, Interior Intimacies, is really about exploring um, the idea of intimacy in our domestic spaces. And I'm thinking about that in a few ways. Um, in the first way, I'm thinking about how we understand private and public space. From a feminist standpoint, you know, private spaces have been coded historically as feminine spaces, whereas the public sphere has been the place where men primarily interact and do the politics and make and exchange the money. Um, and of course, while those um, spheres have certainly dissolved in terms of their um, like intense boundaries in our contemporary reality, the history of those spaces are still with us. And I would argue still shape the ideas that um, kind of give us our sense of how we understand femininity and masculinity. Um, I'd also argue that my work is really interested in connecting to the art historical context of domestic spheres and who has been able to um, paint what kinds of scenes. So from a historical context, I'll talk about this a little bit more. I'm really interested in thinking about like who gets to decide what's in the art history canon? Like how do certain things get seen as like the, the real art that artists make versus like craft or folk art? And of course, like all the associated dyna dynamics of how that shapes our understanding of the work. Um, I'm also thinking about intimacy in terms of representing my own relationship to my space as a queer Chicana living in rural Minnesota. So in 2017, I moved to this 20 acre spot of land where my wife and I live. And um, that was a big change from growing up in Albuquerque, living in Minneapolis, and then later in a smaller city in 
um, you know, the border community of Fargo, North Dakota. And so um, I hope that in my work, the lack of human figures in the scenes allow for not only the viewer to imagine myself in relation to the place, but also themselves in relation to the place. Um, I'm also really interested in like the multi-layered conversations, right? So um, I am using this mix mixed media format to try to um, elevate some other conversations about art. So, you know, cross stitch is really interesting to me. It's my first entry point into making actually when I was young I started cross stitching and I have been doing it since I was eight and as a bicultural person as somebody with a Mexican-American mother and a white father who has English roots I'm really fascinated by the ways that both of those cultures have very rich cross stitching traditions even though they're like differently um, executed and for different purposes but it really helps me feel like whole when I cross stitch and I'm really interested in that play between what we define as craft versus fine art and thinking about how can we integrate some of these things that aren't always in conversation with each other as a way to destabilize some of those hierarchies that exist in the art world. And then of course, like in the cross stitch elements, I'm happy to talk about it more. Um, I draw on a lot of symbols that are in art um, throughout time and that are important to um, Chicanx identity. I need to take a drink of my tea. So the last way that I would say that I'm really grappling with this idea of intimacy is through the way that we share of ourselves in our digital media landscapes. And so making these on square canvases was a purposeful way that I am playing with this idea of the square as a visual imagery um, frame through Instagram and um, thinking about how on Instagram, you know, femininity and domesticity is really glossy and it's very curated and it's a facade of the best points of people's lives, the clean spaces of their houses. And of course, like none of us live these clean and mess free lives that show up on our screens, on our phones. And so in the context of this like capitalist marketplace, I'm really fascinated in terms of like what images proliferate and how, right? In terms of like um, some of the aesthetic choices that people make and see other people making and then copy. And so um, I really thought a lot about that in terms of my own aesthetic choices in the series. So one way that those IG Instagram aesthetics show up in the work is through the ways that I frame my compositions to almost like mirror this idea of like a photograph, like a painting of a photograph. Although I painted them in the place that I was in my house. And so I'm also trying to get us to think about like what is real and um, what is the relationship between the curated space and one's real lived in spaces, the imaginary and real places of my home. Another way that kind of shows up in my work is that um, other than the first painting that I showed you, the rest of the walls of my home are not these colors. Um, although my entryway is now this yellow color. At the time that I painted this picture, it was not. Um, and so um, I play a lot with the decisions of like what objects get put in the space and why um, as again, trying to reference like the curation of those Instagram places. I also kind of play with that, um, challenging that idea of like what's real through the use of drips in all of the paintings. So trying to destabilize this idea of like the clean and perfect place um, by integrating purposeful drips and allowing spontaneous drips to exist in the work. 
Uh, just to kind of remind us that there are paintings. I mean, hopefully you know that they're painting. They're obviously not photorealistic. Um, they're, they have like a unique perspective and representation of objects in them. So they're not like real, but I really like to play with drips also because it helps remind you that it's a painting and that there's something particular about the medium of painting that I'm really drawn to instead of just framing these and editing these as a photograph, which I also could very easily do. And so I hope that you all are taking away some of uh, the ways that I explore my own internal relationship to the objects of my home um, and the ways that I as a queer femme storyteller am trying to tell some stories that have multiple interpretations based on the viewer's perspective and the viewer's access to different understandings of the symbols or the colors or um, some of the objects that I place in particular relation to each other. Um, I also hope that the work is in conversation from a historical perspective with other um, painters. Again, I'm really drawn to painting as a medium. And as I was working on these, I was thinking a lot about how, um, like if we look throughout time, women have been kind of confined to their home as a place for, the site where they could actually have paintings. Um, so if you think about like the Impressionists, for instance, in the mid 1800s, most of the women artists that we know of were painting these very domestic scenes of like women with children or um, spaces within the home because that's who they had access to in terms of models and the spaces that they were allowed to inhabit. But also as a Chicana, you know, um, the space of the home and the domestic space has been an important and vital way that Chicana feminism has made sense of, um, you know, our gender and our sexuality as Chicanas. And so connecting to some important Chicana feminist painters is also uh, what I hope the work is showing. And then I'm also hoping that the work shows that there's this desire to have further conversations about our contemporary moment in terms of thinking about how we understand femininity and um, both the confines of what that has traditionally and historically meant, but also how we can repair um, the maligning of femininity as a quality that anybody regardless of their gender can inhabit. Um, whether that's in our private or public spheres. And then lastly, my work is really ultimately about, um, you know, destabilizing these notions of fine art versus like folk art. Um, as a femme Chicana scholar, I've really been interested in the ways that women have been kind of pigeonholed into areas of expertise that they're allowed to have. So like, you know, we call them the four Fs that women are allowed to be experts at food, fashion, furnishings, and family, but not really allowed the same ability to be experts on like the political stage or, you know, economically or these other ways that we make sense of our worlds. And so how might we look to ways again to kind of destabilize that negative ways that women have been put into those boxes and also honor the really rich and beautiful gifts that femininity can bring. And then ultimately, hopefully, my work is about creating opportunities for queer utopia and like imagining the worlds that are free of the isms um, that bring us the ability to be our fullest and most authentic spaces and that we all have what we need in order to do that. So with that crash course on the work, I will turn it over to folks if there's questions that have popped up into the chat or if people have questions about any of the individual pieces, I'm happy to talk about them um, or any questions that you might have at this time.
So Candace, during this process, you know, you are exposing and painting, thinking deeply about your own home. And you're not the only one in that home. So to what extent is there inspiration here and conversation that has enriched your artwork from um, Liz? Oh, my sweet Vimo. Um, uh, that's my, my love. Um, Vimo is um, wife in Finnish and that's my dog. She also inspires some thinking about the space. Um, that's a great question, Sonia. So, I will say, you know, at the beginning of this process, I was painting this piece and this is a very personal piece. It is of our bedroom and it is probably the most realistic painting in terms of how I imagine our space to be because it is the only piece so far of our house where I have like painted the walls that color and purchase this bedding and like made that headboard and decorated this room in this particular way. And so it is very intimate to share one's bedroom with the world. And, you know, as two queer women living together in rural Minnesota, I think it's kind of, you know, people have said like, it's kind of edgy work or it's, um, you know, brave or courageous to like share these realities of our life together. Um, my lovely Vimo is a very private person. She's a major introvert. <laughs> she <laughs> likes to be described as Vimo on my social media um, because she doesn't want to be tagged or like, you know, she doesn't want to be <laughs> as closely linked to my outgoing, like carefree um, sharing of our lifestyle in the same way. And I totally respect that. And I think it enriches our conversations because she doesn't want to, you know, censor my work in any way. But I do think that it's responsible to share like, hey, this is where the work is going, or I'm thinking about doing this, mm -hmm. you know, um, since we're amongst friends, like, um, you know, having a harness hanging in the laundry room is really, you know, calling into everybody's attention, like, some of the, you know, realities of life, like, that we are sexual creatures, that we have sexualities, that we are married, that that marriage isn't, you know, just like this, I don't know, it's not a facade, like, there's a physical aspect to the love that we share with one another. And so um, we certainly have conversations about the space in that way. Uh, she also probably um, is really wonderful in the sense that anything I want to do decor style, decor wise in the house, I think she cares much less about the outcome. And so <laughs> I get away with whatever I want, basically, because you know, she's gonna go along um, based on what ends up happening. So in some ways it's also really fun because it's kind of serving as like a sketchbook for possibilities. Like I asked her if we should paint the laundry room red after she saw this rendering of it. And she's like, that could be interesting, but I would never do that because painting walls red is really difficult. <laughs> and the background for this painting took like four or five coats and, mm -hmm was a lot of work. So mm -hmm. did I answer your question sufficiently, yeah. Sonia? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is Becky. Can, can you, am I on? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I, I'm just wondering, you know, all the times that you and Liz have stayed all night at my house and we had conversations about, you know, with 12 kids and 18 grandchildren and now four great grandchildren, how every wall is, is filled with, um, uh, you know, it's just crowded with kids' pictures. And we talked about that crowding. Um, did that enter, since we talked about it, did that enter your thoughts at all as you were painting inside a house? 
Um, do you mean about like what ends up on the walls in my interior? Yeah, yeah. Because we talked about, you know, you know, how the walls were so crowded with, because I, like I said, well, with 12 children and 18 grandchildren, everyone knows where their pictures are. And I, you know, and so they have to remain there. I, I just wondered if that conversation entered into your, your thoughts about inside rooms at all. Not that specific piece. Um, thank you for reminding me about that. But I would say I did think a lot about the negative space of each of these places. And there isn't a lot necessarily on walls in many of the compositions. Um, I would say with the in respect to this piece and the piece called that one tequila in the skull bottle that has a lot of like artwork on the walls. Um, most of the artwork that shows up in the wall space are those mixed media pieces that I sewed into the scene. And I, I feel like part of my reasoning for that was trying to get balance between the objects and some of the negative space in the paintings. But also I'm really intrigued by a flat background. And so like the use of latex paint in like creating a very glossy and similarly saturated field of pigment just feels like to me, it allows the objects to really take center stage in each of those compositions. Um, so I guess I can show this one too. Um, this one probably has the most pieces of art in it. Um, and they are, you know, real art that I've collected over the years that are tequila themed for the most part. Um, Cause I'm really into tequila and wish I was drinking some right now. Mm. But thank you for that question. Candace, I'm a little curious about the, um, the cross stitch pieces. And a few people have asked me about that too, and they come in to see them. Are they in fact backwards? <laughs> they are, yeah, thank you. I was gonna mention that when I was talking about this. Um, they are outside in, out, the back is out towards the viewer and, I did that partly because I think they're more visually interesting. And um, when I originally did it, in my first painting, you'll see I have a Virgen de Guadalupe in the top corner there. I had cross-stitched her the wrong way. <laughs> so La Virgen typically, you know, is facing a particular way. And when I had made the image, like the pattern to stitch her, I had forgotten to reverse the image. And so she was facing the wrong way. Um, I mean, I guess there's not really a wrong or a right way, but it felt wrong to me. And so I was like, how am I gonna fix this? Like, I can't restitch this entire Virgen de Guadalupe because it was quite an intensive time situation. Um, and I flipped it over and realized that she would be facing the correct way. And I found that it was just a lot more fun to look at the threads in that, in that context and that they added a layer of three dimensionality to the canvas that I really like. Um, and then lastly, I'm a major perfectionist. I'm a recovering perfectionist and um, putting the mistakes and the parts that you're usually not supposed to see on a cross stitch out for everybody to enjoy is kind of a little nod to myself to not take myself so seriously in my work mm -hmm. and to like, you know, remain okay with like, you know, what comes out on the, in my stitching or on my canvas through my painting. So what you just said about working against perfection may be partly the answer then to the question that I just noticed. And you talked about it, this theme about, I think you used the word maybe disrupting um, a lot of different notions then. 
because you're also disrupting by, you know, I'm just really attracted to the objects that are totally not correctly proportioned, right? Like the laundry basket and some other things that are like, oh my God, that's so funny. I totally want to straighten it out, right? Mm -hmm. um, so talk about that. Oh, and so that's one part of the question. The other one is you talked a little bit about some other painters. There are other painters too that work with that distortion. And I just really think that that's so freaking great that things are funnily distorted like that. It's like one of the things that really make me smile. So I don't know, I just want you to talk more about that, I guess. Yeah, I think um, part of it is that perfectionism situation and part of it is like visually interesting. So again, especially in this series, because I do feel like I could have taken a photograph of my laundry room. Like I could have made it happen so that you would see the scene photographically. And I could have made a very flat red background and I could have like enhanced particular objects and like changed their proportions through Photoshop. Um, but the fun of painting is that you don't have to do that work digitally. Like you get to decide what feels right in relation to the, the end composition. And so another painting where I feel like that's really evident is in this one, um, The Monarch's Return. You know, my sweet Vimos Keens, the epitome of lesbian shoes down there are very tiny. And I could have is made them- Is that what they are? Yeah, they're little Keens. Um, they're, they're very tiny. And I could have made them larger and when I was working on them, um, I decided to keep them small, partly because I was really thinking a lot about like, what does an entryway mean? Like an entryway into somebody's house. And um, this painting is called Monarch's Return because we have the really beautiful monarch butterfly print that's done by a famous Latina printmaker Fabiana Rodriguez, if you're not familiar with her work. Um, and so I was like doing an homage to her work in my painting, but also thinking about like the monarch as a king and like the entrance of royalty into one's home. And so that's why I have these like kind of guardians that are hearkening back to these like cultures that have relied on these strong cats as like a sign of masculine strength. Mm -hmm. um, so I love the proportions in this painting because it helps me feel like, like trying to evoke the emotions of how you feel when you enter into a palace, right? Like feeling small in these architecturally large details. And I don't know how high my entryway ceiling goes, but we have lofted ceilings, I don't know, 14 feet high maybe. And so like the space is really, really tall. And the way to kind of evoke that sensation was to make the objects in this painting kind of small. Yeah, but I think, you know, we were talking before the talk started about like, sometimes I don't know where these things come out of and, also, there's that point, like I have to just be okay with the weird proportions or have to be okay with the perspective, you know, wrongness. But I think that's actually what makes the work kind of compelling to look at mm -hmm. instead of just like a glossy photograph that's realistic of the space. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also was drawn to kind of the cartoon chainsaw the, you know, the way the blades kind of a duck bill kind of looking, it cracks me up. You like this? Yeah. I love how that's your favorite. Of course, that's your favorite, Heidi. Actually, I love this um, rendering of the chainsaw so much. It's on my business card right now, so... I too really enjoy this rendering of a chainsaw and lots of people have asked like why is there a chainsaw in your front door it's like well do you live in a rural environment where you have to take down trees to leave your house because <laughs> that's my reality that I share with my love so 
the chainsaw is not very far away from the front door at any given time. Hi, Candace. I have a question. Hi, Nathan, please. Um, this is a question I've never asked you. Uh, in one of the paintings, so the cross stitch pieces are kind of integrated into the scenes. At the dinner for two scene, I, I think that's the name, um, it's kind of floating almost like a tarot card down in the front. And I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> and uh, what was the placement choice there instead of integrating it into the scene a little bit more? Thank you for that question. Um, you're right, many of the cross-stitched elements function as art or like hanging work on a wall so that they read like they belonged there in that way. Um, this symbol in Tablescape for Two is uh, corn, an ear of corn. And, um, you know, when I am working on each of these paintings, in my mind, I have an idea of where the cross-stitched element is gonna go as I lay in my composition. And of course that might change by the end after the painting is finished. But I had imagined that this one was going to kind of be growing out of the baseboard. But because of like the perspectival way of like shooting into this alcove, um, sewing it into the baseboard didn't work because I couldn't shift this like flat 2D piece to like angle in the way that I really wanted it to. And so I played around, I put it up on the top above the windows and I put it like, you know, next to the table and some of the other open space of the walls and balance wise, it just made sense to add it as a possible dinner guest <laughs> to the table. Um, you know, this, the name of this piece is tablescape for two question mark because there's clearly more seats around the table than just the two place settings. And um, I liked to think about the corn as a possible dinner guest and also like connecting to the roots of like the kinds of food that I make in my house, you know, as a Chicana um, making things that involve corn, like corn being a very important kind of matriarchal lineage of like food and also wisdom and connecting to that importance and giving it its own privilege at the table um, just ended up over in the corner there kind of growing out of the wooden floor and then I also just thought that it helped with the composition to balance out the nature scene that you see outside of the windows and you know, it's an interesting painting to me because I'm not a landscape painter. Um, landscape is not my favorite genre to paint. And of course I picked this scene and part of the brilliance and beauty of living where we live is that we have this amazing scene of a lake outside of our window. And as you know, I was like cursing at every single one of those tree branches and <laughs> trunks as I was placing them and like really just kicking myself for like, why did I give myself the challenge of doing an interior and an exterior scene at the same time? But I am also a glutton for punishment and I like to push myself. And that was my follow up is that I know you don't like painting landscapes, but there's something otherworldly and really hypnotic about these landscapes, both in this one and the, the one that takes place with Willa sitting outside or standing outside. It's it feels like you're you're protected from something else in, in this painting. And I really love how the landscape turned out. I don't think I've seen this one completed. So bravo. Thank you, Nay. And here's the one that Nathan mentioned, dreaming new archives on the guest room with my hey, Matt. oh yeah, Sorry. go ahead, Alex. Prima, can you talk um, about how your work specific, like comes into conversation specifically with the works of Patsy Valdez and Cardona Mascarza? Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, 
I am really in love with Patsy Valdez's um, interior scenes and she really evokes a lot of emotion through her paintings and um, I love being in conversation in similar ways like thinking about like the emotional layer of these intimate spaces like allowing somebody into your home allowing someone into the glimpses of one's private life that they might not be otherwise privy to, but also that layer of like, what it feels like to have like a really lovely homemade meal or what it feels like to come home and feel like greeted by, um, you know, your objects or how you've curated your space. And so I think I'm really trying to draw on how to express that like emotional vitality of life that comes through our home spaces that would be similar to some of the ways that I feel like Patsy Valdez does in her interior painting. And then, um, let me see which one would be good for this. Carmen Lomas Garza's work, you know, as a Texas-based painter, um, I find some similarities in terms of like my aesthetic choices as somebody who grew up in the desert, but now lives in the Midwest of thinking about like how to integrate some of those colors and remain true to the spirit of my Midwestern experience and my Minnesota experience, particularly through these pieces, um, but also kind of connect through memory to like my past and my desert experience. And I know um, Lomas Garza does a lot of work around memory and about like, you know, upholding cultural traditions. And so I feel like a lot of my work is trying to like grasp at some of that and to like have these subtle messages in the work. Like this is a very Minnesota kitchen. This is very much not cabin cabinetry that I would choose, right? These are the cabinets of the former owner. And these are like pretty realistic to what's in my kitchen currently. And yet there's a comal on the stove, right? And like there's a molcajete that connects me to these like ancestral traditional um, like women's knowledge that I'm trying to like also integrate into the spirit of my paintings. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, the wonderful goat you know, you can't leave an interior scene without a goat. <laughs> and that is Willa, <laughs> who does like to peep in on guests who stay at our house. So this is her favorite place to stand whenever anybody is in this room. Um, this is a room that, so Liz and I, um, hope to have like an artist retreat, bed and breakfast. We've hosted several people like very informally. And we have two wonderful bedrooms down on the basement of our house. And it has these stunning views of the lake and land. And um, the goats are free range on our property, our lawn care <laughs> and our lawn control. And Willa loves paying visits to all of the visitors that come to our house. And so this is a view from the inside of the Gloria Anzaldúa suite. And um, for the savvy viewer and someone who knows the works of Gloria Anzaldúa will probably be able to pick out the books that I'm referencing on the desk there um, as, a, as a way to make some of those memory connections as well. So. Is there a goose still? Oh, Mama Becky, no, <laughs> there's not a goose. We've had so many predators take um, our fowl. So sadly, no geese. We are down to one chicken and one rooster after some gnarly raccoons got into our coop um, last spring. So we're rebuilding our bird brood. I'm so sorry. I've, uh... 
I have a question about Buzz. That got dark real quick. <laughs> we'll bring it back up. All right. Kenzie, go ahead. So Buzz is the only like external scene despite other um, pieces that have windows. Like this one is outside and it might be hard if somebody's unfamiliar with the house to like really recognize that. Um, but so did you like grapple with kind of justifying the setting as it's not exactly an interior, although I mean, I could argue that this is one of the most intimate spaces since I know this is where everyone gets haircuts at the Chickfin Cottage. So if you wanted to kind of like talk about how you arrived to depict this space outside of your home and still include it into the series of intimate interiors. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that that was like my poetic um, interpretation of the word interior. So, you know, interior does mean inside, but here we have the inside out um, in the external world. And um, you're right, like it's called buzz because it's really about that pair of clippers plugged into the wall outside of the front door and connecting to the, the queer history of queer haircuts <laughs> that are do it yourself at home, you know, situations before global pandemics. Um, it's so interesting how so much of my work kind of resonates differently in the context of being confined in one's home space. On one hand, it's really great. I had my subject matter and was really confined to it over the last year. Um, but on the other hand, it's also um, interesting because when I was painting this scene, I had no idea that I was going to have to be legitimately cutting Vimo's hair every three weeks and that she was going to be taking the clippers to my head, which I had never before allowed. So, um, you know, in 2021, this scene is maybe a little bit more tongue in cheek than <laughs> only queer um, since everybody's doing home haircuts these days. Um, but yeah, I feel like the interior is like, we're seeing a lot of interior scenes and what does it mean to show one's interior? And of course you can't have an inside without an outside. Um, thinking about like borders, for instance, lots of people think about borders keep people out, but really they function to keep people in. And so, um, yeah, I just thought a lot about that facet of it. And since I knew that I was going to be painting the other side of the door, it helps create this visual continuity between these different parts of my house. Thanks for the question, though. Are you even to the point, Candace, where you can think about what's been learned through painting these, you know, big works? I mean, this is a lot of work. Are you even to the point yet where you can say, all right, I love these parts. I love what I've learned here. And the next is X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, you know, they are very large works. Yeah. Um, they're not huge, but they're large. Yeah. And I love the scale and I would love yeah. to paint even larger. And I think it really feeds into my um, maybe like deepest desires to be seen and recognized mm -hmm. and not ignored. I feel like the mm -hmm. scale of the work requires you to pay attention, if not at least look, because it takes up so much of your visual field. And I feel like I've learned that about myself, that I love this large scale work because I can both be enveloped in it while I'm doing it, but also because it demands to be seen. Mm -hmm. And um, mm. I just really love that aspect of it, that it's like kind of confrontational because of its scale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been painting on a variety of scales. I also have this series where I'm making tiny tequila studies of like, you know, three by four inch tiny paintings of tiny tequila bottles, 
which came in very handy because of like this scene. I have a very tiny tequila bottle on the table there. But um, I love that work for its other intimacy, right? The other side of intimacy of like the small scale of like really having to like pay a lot of t attention to detail. Um, but I really like working in a larger scale and I think mm -hmm. some of my next work will be really even scaling up a little bit more. And I have the privilege of having a studio space that can allow me to make large work. I think my challenge will be storing my work if it's not moving out of my studio. But um, for now, I've got a lot of empty wall space in this large house. So I'll just put the scenes of my bathroom in the living room and have new conversations about the, the way my house is working for us. Thank you. Yeah. I'd also say that I, I feel like this series really helped me develop my visual voice, if that's a thing, um, that it's helped me hone in on what it means for me to paint a scene um, and what, what um, qualities I want to make sure are in any painting that I do. And one of those would be my love of color and a flat background um, and not shying away from like colors that might burn your retina. <laughs> I mean, I just really, again, like to your point, your question earlier, Sonia, I feel like they demand to be seen and like that vibrant color also just like functions differently, especially mm -hmm. in like our dreary, like winter days here mm -hmm. in Minnesota, you know, like it's saying something visually that I think disrupts our notions of like a white Midwestern space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I saw maybe is somebody asking a question in the chat. Hmm. Just a comment, Jim likes what he sees. Thanks, Jim. Well, if there's nothing else, I'll leave us here and encourage you all if you haven't already and if you can make it to the gallery to go see the work in person, um, I invite you to my home inside the McCrosty Gallery. <laughs> and of course, all of you are always welcome at the Chick Fin Cottage. Um, I am really happy to open the doors to my interior life to respectful visitors. I would like to say that looking at the exhibit here on this Memorial Day, a uh, day of memory, that it's absolutely amazing that two wonderful things are happening on this very same day. Congratulations. Thank you, Becky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess I would just uh, also like to thank everyone for, for tuning in for the artist talk and for joining us this evening. Um, and uh, yes, please do come and visit. We would love to see you. It's uh, now that the holidays have passed, it's, it's a little quieter around Macrosti and it's very COVID friendly. So you don't have to worry about uh, <laughs> running into too many people. You can keep your safe <laughs> distance. Um, so yes, um, please do come say hello or check it out online too. You can definitely um, see the work there. And um, yeah, thanks for being here and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Yeah, thank you.